now live if you are in attendance and you can see the chat please let me know that you can hear me that would be awesome i have my very special assistant my son eric who's in the other room and who is going to let me know if i can't be heard um but please uh please comment in the chat and if you do have questions, if there's things that you're feeling not so great about, please do share. And actually, there we go. I'm going to ask you, what aspects of plant-based nutrition do you feel the least confident about? And what do you worry about when it comes to plant-based eating and health? Hi, Jules from the UK. Good to see you. Thank you for being here. So I'm going to start in just one second. If somebody can just confirm in the chat that you can hear me okay, that would be fantastic. Wonderful, thank you very much, I appreciate that. Okay, well without further ado, I will get started and I will uh, just start by reminding you that this is a talk about healthy plant-based nutrition at all ages with the goals of fueling vitality and preventing disease. I will not address curative nutrition, meaning I'm not addressing nutrition in the context of managing or reversing health issues, whether it's diabetes, heart disease, or whatnot. These are all measures, of course, that would help. But if you are struggling with any kind of health condition, please um, approach and work with a plant-based or plant-friendly physician, registered dietitian in particular, so that they can help you with your specific condition. So I'm also not going to be answering questions about reversing disease or managing disease, but I'm very happy to help you with prevention. That's within uh, my scope of practice. And we're going to go back to that in a moment. Let me stop sharing my screen so that you can see me in all my glory here. There we go. Hello. Good to see that there's a few people with me today. That's wonderful. Thank you for being here. Um, I'll quickly introduce myself first. And, um, and then we're going to talk about why plant-based nutrition matters in terms of everyday meal planning. And then we're going to talk about different kinds of approaches that can help us fit all the nutrients we need in our everyday meals. And finally, I'm going to give you some examples drawn from my real life of how those nutrients can work together in everyday life. And at any moment, feel free to ask your questions. I'm a one-woman show other than my assistant in the other room checking that the sound doesn't fall. Um, but I'll, be, I'll do my best to monitor the chat. And also, if you can't log in, I've put my email address there. And at two different points in the talk, I will check to make sure that um, there's no questions coming in. There's a question from Sharon. My nutritionist has suggested I need to increase protein intake, expecting to increase to 120 grams per day. Wow, that is a lot of protein. Um, that's probably not a question I will answer directly in this context. Um, I would need more information about why that request has been made, so I don't want to go into more detail in this public space. But if you want to message me, we can talk about it. Uh, Yes, indeed. Nutritionists and physicians and pretty much all health professionals need a bit of a reboot sometimes when it comes to plant-based eating. Okay, so who's Brigitte? Who am I? Um, my background and qualifications, I think this is important since we're going to be talking about nutrition, is that I am a PhD in sociology uh, and in the sociology of education more specifically which means that I am not a physician, I am not a dietitian. I do, however, have a couple of certificates in plant-based nutrition, one from the University of Winchester in the UK and one from the University of Guelph in Canada. I encourage everyone to look up those two programs because they are great. And especially the University of Winchester program is a short program led by Shireen Kassam, the amazing uh, plant-based physician. And um, both programs would help you 
get really confident in terms of your knowledge of plant-based nutrition if that's something you're curious about. The one in Winchester is a, is a short program, so warmly recommended. I came to plant-based eating and cooking in 2014. I came first for the environment, but in 2015 I decided to go fully vegan, very committed for the animals, and that is my backstory. You can read a lot more or listen to more about that on my website, veganfamilykitchen.com. I'm the mother of two amazing kids. I have a rather athletic husband. I'm also a part-time athlete myself, and um, so I have to feed a lot of people. And I have to say I'm very grateful that both my mother and my in-laws are uh, rather in, in good health. Um, but something that really turned me on to thinking about plant-based eating for health is that my father passed away in March 2020, um, basically from dementia, but from the consequences of lifelong poor self-care when it came to food and other consumption. And it's brought to me in very sharp relief how important it is to eat well, to keep ourselves vital, energetic, and healthy throughout our life and to be with our loved ones and to show up our best in the world. Because why does this matter? Why does find getting all of our nutrients, why is that important? I'd like to remind you that we are what we eat. Our bodies are not made from food that our mom ate 40 something years ago anymore, or 50 or 30 or 20. Our bodies have cells that are constantly renewed and they're rebuilt from the food that we eat, basically, from what we consume. And every so many days, every couple of months at most, pretty much all of our cells in our bodies are replaced. And so what we eat is, is really the building material for everything that we are and how we can show up our best in daily life. Prevention of chronic disease is key and a wholesome, healthy, vegan, plant-based diet can very much help with that. It's not a silver bullet, but it can make a world of difference. And also can increase our resilience if ever we are injured or we do get sick, which happens even to healthy vegans. And really this is about showing up our best in the world and um, helping make the world a better place. You will notice that I refer a lot to my notes today because there's a lot I want to make sure to cover in this workshop and I want to also have a little bit of time for questions. So I'll hope you'll be patient with me as I sometimes have to glance down at my notes to make sure I don't forget anything. And let me have a quick look at the chat. I'm glad you can hear me. Um, StudentNet asks uh, if they can have a blank meal plan template. Yes, you can find that if you go to veganfamilykitchen.com slash templates. Um, I'll put it in the chat, veganfamilykitchen.com slash templates. Um, even better than that, you know, just go and click templates at the top. I can't type. So you go to veganfamilykitchen.com, click templates at the top, and you will be all set. There's a lot of templates you can download in that location. I have another question about how to get the right amount of calcium. I will totally be addressing that later. Not sure if you're getting enough after being mostly plant-based for more than six years. This is a really important question. Thank you for asking it. Just because we're vegan doesn't mean that every nutrient comes to us. Um, not getting cow's milk is not a problem in terms of getting enough calcium, but we do need to be aware uh, in terms of contributing to bone health to make sure that we do get enough calcium. And dietary calcium is important, but there's also other aspects. I do have a whole blog post called um, Calcium for Vegans that you can see if you click on the health section at veganfamilykitchen.com. So... I will start by talking about the nutrient-based approach. So the question for this talk today is, can we find and can we fit all the nutrients we need for our best daily life from everyday plant-based meals? And I've said yes, the answer is yes, emphatically. But of course, it's not automatic. If we just eat pasta and tomato sauce all day long, 
we will not be getting all those nutrients, that's for sure. We would probably be getting enough protein, but that's a conversation for another day. We need to have a diverse approach to nutrition. We need to get lots of different foods every day. And there's different lenses we can apply to the issue to analyze, if you like, our daily meal consumption and think about what it is that um, we're getting and what is it that maybe is missing. The standard approach and the one that has been dominant in the field of nutrition and dietetics for the last probably hundreds of years, hundred years, has been a nutrient-based approach, what I would call a slightly reductionist approach that really comes from a science lens. And I love science. We've made so much progress in the science of nutrition. And there's two big parts to that. Well, three big parts. The first one is the number of calories. How many calories are we eating every day? One of the mistakes that a lot of new people that come, uh, new plant-based eaters make is that they're not eating enough food. And if you're not getting enough food, then you're probably not getting enough nutrients. Plant foods are a lot less calorie dense than their meat counterparts. For example, if you have a tiny bit of meat, it might have, let's say, 200 calories and you would need you know, this much broccoli to have the same amount of calories. So many people may not be eating enough, enough foods, maybe not enough snacks, especially if you are quite athletic or you have a very physical job or you spend your whole day outside in the garden and walking, you have to be aware that um, you're eating the right amount of calories. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. Uh, to keep in mind. A second lens, again, the strict nutrition dietetics approach would be the macro macronutrients lens. How much protein, how much carbohydrates, and how much fat am I getting? There has been an obsession with protein in our world. There's uh, at least two or three books that have been written about how obsessed we've become with protein and how did that happen. And that is really unfortunate. I mean, yes, protein is important, but the bottom line is most people are getting enough. And the problem is most people are not getting enough fiber. And that's been a bit of a new thing. I think it's becoming more on top of consciousness for many people, but there's still an obsession with protein. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be getting any protein. Protein surely is important, but that's a typical lens that I don't think is all that useful when it comes to getting the full slate of nutrients we need. This being said, on a daily basis, we should be aiming at getting roughly one gram of protein per kilogram of healthy weight. So if we are in a situation where our weight is more than it should be in terms of maintaining our health, then we should probably not be using our current weight as the basis for the equation of finding out how much protein we should be eating. In my case, my healthy weight is probably around 100 and 28, 130 pounds kind of thing. I lift heavy things at the gym and that's about 58 kilos, I think, something like that. So I aim for a little bit over 60 grams of protein a day, but I'm finding that it's very easy to get those grams of protein by applying the other lenses. And we're going to come back to that in a few moments. If I was weighing currently, let's say 160, 170 pounds, let's say 70, 80 kilos, then I would probably um, still be needing to aim for about 60 grams of protein every day, not for 70 or 80 grams. Something to keep in mind. Another lens that we can apply is the lens of micronutrients. What are the so-called micronutrients of interest or of concern that we need to be thinking about? Calcium, iron, zinc, and iodine are the four primary ones, in my opinion, that we need to be considering when we're thinking about a plant-based diet. Calcium is a consideration for everyone, but perhaps more so on a plant-based diet because we're not getting the obvious calcium from dairy products. This being said, I don't think the calcium from dairy products is actually that great, but that's a conversation for another day. Iron is a concern for many people on a plant-based and not on a plant-based diet the same. 
uh, especially for women as or people who menstruate, who are losing some blood all the time, every once a month or more. And so iron is definitely something that should be on top of mind. Zinc also very important for the good functioning of our cells. And many people are zinc deficient, again, both in uh, plant-based and non-plant-based diets. Iodine tends to be a little bit more of a concern for plant-based people if we're not, as we're not eating fish products or products from the sea. However, I'm going to resolve that for now by just telling you it's okay to use iodized salt and it completely pretty much resolves the problem. If you have issues with iodine and you've been tested and you need a supplement, that's fine. Um, but m consumption of some sea vegetables like seaweed and uh, cooking with iodized salt deals with the problem on a daily basis. Still in the micronutrient space, I want to insist on two things. There is one nutrient that cannot be consumed in sufficient quantity from a plant-based diet, and that is vitamin B12. There's a whole article on my website, Should I Supplement B12? I strongly encourage you to read it, but to me that is not negotiable. Every person who eats a mostly plant-based diet, even if they're not fully vegan, along with pretty much everybody over age 50, should be supplementing vitamin B12. It is a simple thing. There is no side effects. Just do it. The other supplement that I strongly recommend looking into for the vast majority of people is vitamin D. Vitamin D deficiency can be very debilitating in so many different ways, and you don't want to go without. So unless you're spending a lot of time in the sunshine, and I mean a lot of time without sunscreen, which you probably shouldn't be doing, then you probably need to supplement vitamin D as well. It doesn't take a lot, but it's something that is very important. And if you're drinking um, supplemented plant-based milk, for example, there is more likely than not going to be a vitamin D supplementation in there. But even then, just take a supplement for peace of mind. If you have any questions so far, please put them in the chat. I'm monitoring that. I'm just going to have a quick look at my email because I know some people don't have an account. I do have something here. Okay, it looks like it's working. Okay, sounds good. So if you have questions, put them in the chat and I'm going to keep going. What I find a lot more helpful than the nutrient-based framework when thinking about meal planning. And when I mean useful, I mean for everyday life of normal people like us. I think a food-based framework is a lot more useful. And I'm going to share with you the most recent update to the Canadian Food Guide. Here it goes. If you haven't seen it yet, I am so excited. Hold on, it's coming. There you go. Here we go. Here's the Canada Food Guide. Okay, the Canada Food Guide is such an innovation because for the first time in a hundred years, Canada did not allow the food industry to have a seat at the table when it came to determining what it is we should be eating. Instead, they just read the science and not just the hard sciences um, like biology and medicine, but they also took a look at the social sciences because there's a lot of factors in terms of uh, good nutrition that also happen in the non-specifically biological realm. And the results are just fantastic. And I'm so glad because also I'm aware of how much the public servants had to resist the push from industry to get involved in creating the Canada Food Guide and how much the, the politics aspect of it, how much pressure the members of Parliament of Canada were under to try to stop this. This is amazing. It came out in 2019 and it's just a fabulous tool. Let's have a look at it. What do we have in the Canada Food Guide as a lens to apply to our meals? It says half of your plate should be filled with vegetables and fruit. You should have plenty of it. A lot. Okay. I'd say even ad libitum. If it's more than half your plate, it's probably just fine. 
a quarter of your plate should have protein rich foods and they also said choose mostly plants it doesn't show here uh, unfortunately it's not on the graph but it is repeated throughout the document choose mostly plants isn't that amazing a quarter of the plate should be constituted of whole grain foods and they don't say that but I would say that um, starchy um, wholesome vegetables like orange sweet potatoes for example would be a perfectly suitable fit in this corner as well they add make water your drink of choice isn't that awesome and something I would add to this actually two things I would add to the Canada food guide are that you want to sprinkle your plate with a little bit of nuts and seeds in the Canada food guide nuts and seeds are included in the protein foods and that is fair uh, but I think it doesn't hurt for lots of reasons we're going to see a little later to also have a little to sprinkle them on top or you can turn them into wonderful creamy dressings um, that are way better for you as well than the commercial versions and that's pretty easy to do the other addition I would make is to add spice and that's not really mentioned in the Canada food guide but that is certainly important not only to make the food taste better but also and to be more culturally interesting but also for lots of health reasons that we're going to go over in a moment so when you think about your meals just think do I have at least half my plate with vegetables and maybe a bit of fruit do I have protein foods so are there some kinds of beans tofu tempeh in there do I have whole grains that are essential for heart health in particular as well as good digestion and all of these things have a lot of fibers so so far so good and am I drinking plenty of water and am I accompanying my meals with water a little bit of spice a little bit of nuts and seeds and you are golden the number of North Americans that consumes at least I want to say five portions of vegetables a day I think that's right is less than one in ten less than one in ten people is eating at least five portions of fruit and vegetables per day and even if you do just that if you're currently far away from that if you improve the amount of fruits and vegetables you eat every day you will blast your health out of the ballpark it's fantastic how much of a difference it can make so think about that and I would like to ask you to put in the chat if you're connected with me right now what is the proportion of your meals that consists of vegetables and fruit right now eyeball it of course but do you think you're anywhere near half I would really like to know about that and I'm going to add something about the fruit and vegetable here because somebody asked me in a workshop a couple weeks ago can I have different compositions at different meals you know could I have a meal that's more heavy on the vegetables so that I can have a meal that's more heavy on the protein or is that even good for you to have meals that are more protein heavy say in the morning and more carb heavy in the evening keep in mind going back to the Canada food guide that half your plate of vegetables that's a lot of vegetables so if you're falling behind from your first meal of the day by not having too many vegetables or fruit you need to catch up in the rest of the day which is absolutely possible but you need to keep that in mind so for example as you'll see a little later I have a breakfast that's mostly oats chia seeds and fruit and I don't think it's half fruit really I think it's mostly chia seeds with some oats and fruit and I need to catch up on the vegetable and fruit dimension when I come to lunchtime and that means I have a lot of vegetables in my lunch so that's something to keep in mind congratulations Caitlin on being close to the mark at least for dinner yes and that's the trick so we're going to go over some strategies you can use to boost your produce um, after this because first I want to tell you about another lens so the Canada food guide is the first lens you can use that's very practical and way better really than that micronutrient approach now 
the second lens that I suggest is that of Dr. Greger's, Dr. Michael Greger's Daily Dozen. If you're not already familiar with um, nutritionfacts.org, I strongly encourage you to go to that website. That would be absolutely wonderful um, for you. There's a lot of resources and information there. And in his book, How Not to Die... Some people think it's a bad title. I think it says what it has to say. In How Not to Die, Dr. Greger goes over the foods we need to eat to prevent chronic disease, fend off cancer as much as we can. And again, it's not a silver bullet. Doing all those things doesn't mean you'll never get sick. And there's other environmental factors that play in. But it will certainly, statistically speaking, greatly reduce our odds of unnecessary illness. So, Dr. Greger, having done all the research, and there's like 5,000 footnotes in this document, has come up with this list of 12 foods, 10 foods, one beverage, and one exercise category that we should tick off every single day. I'll go over it really quickly. Beans, three servings a day. We're talking about one and a half cups of cooked beans every day. And that would include tofu and tempeh products, which are based on beans. Berries, one portion a day. Other fruits, three more portions. So right there you have three, four portions of fruit. Cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, cabbage, even mustard, radishes. Those are all cruciferous vegetables. Amazing for cancer fighting. Um, phytonutrients, at least one serving every single day. Greens, other than the cruciferous vegetables at least two servings a day, and we're talking about one packed cup, uh, raw or half a cup cooked. Other vegetables, two more per day, and that would include things like orange vegetables and mushrooms. Technically speaking, mushrooms are not plants, they're fungus in the fungus category, but as a plant-based person, that's the only non-plant I eat is fungi. Uh, Flaxseed is an other ingredient he puts in there. Uh, it's very rich. In omega-3, healthy fats uh, also has um, compounds, phytonutrients that fight cancer, especially noted to be good against breast cancer. So that's one thing he includes in his daily dozen, at least one serving of nuts every day. That's a quarter cup of nuts or a few tablespoons of nut butter. Herbs and spices, at least a quarter teaspoon every day. Turmeric being the most powerful example here in terms of anti-cancer properties, but also cinnamon is a really good one you can have every day with your breakfast, for example. Whole grains, so back, again, same as the Canada Food Guide, talking about three portions a day, and one portion is basically a slice of bread, half a cup hot cereal like oats and things like that. The other two items on the Daily Dozen, our beverages, about 60 ounces, so that's uh, about two liters, is that right, a day? Something like that, of water. Keep in mind that there's a lot of water in food, and when you eat a plant-based diet, you're getting a lot more um, water in your food than you would be getting in uh, meat, for example, which is very, very low in moisture content. And exercise every day. At least 90 minutes of moderate movement or 40 minutes of vigorous exercise every day. In addition to the Daily Dozen, you see it again here, supplementing B12 is not negotiable. And uh, again, I encourage you to read my article, should I supplement B12 as a vegan or plant-based person? And even as a non-vegan, you should probably be supplementing as well for lots of reasons that are out of this conversation. So please go and have a look. So I would like to know for you, which is the food of the Daily Dozen that is the hardest to include in your everyday meals. Put it in the chat, and when we get to the Q&A section, I will make sure to uh, have some suggestions for you about how you can include more of those. The question is, what is the food from the Daily Dozen that is the hardest for you to include in your daily meals? Going back to the chat, I see Claire is mentioning that you think you're about half I suppose, of vegetables in your plate. At least that's what you strive for when you're cooking. Maybe lacking on greens and grains. Yes, definitely greens, I think, tend to be forgotten. They're a little bit tricky to cook with as well because uh, they're very perishable, right? So you have good intentions and you buy greens on the weekend, but if you're not using them, and I would say front-loading them into your week, 
there's a chance that they will go bad or they will not be super attractive to include in your meals later on. Jules says our veg consumption is great. We don't eat much fruit there. Fruit, nature's candy, as my mom said, easy to put, um, to have as a snack anytime. Again, it's a matter of um, making them available and remembering to eat them, right? Because just buying them doesn't quite do the trick. And some uh, fruit can be quite perishable, and so it can be unfortunate if we buy them and they go bad, right? There's nothing sadder than buying like really expensive organic raspberries and then finding out they are rotten before you eat them. That is heart-wrenching in so many different ways. Um, I have a question that came in through email. Uh, welcome any tips you have found for feeding kid, kids aged three to six plant-based everything, but especially vegetables. Yes, variety is healthy, but sometimes it's disheartening to try. Okay, I will go back to feeding kids at the end. I will put that question. I will try to keep it top of my mind here. Oh, so about the daily dozen, getting the greens in a little tricky, getting the fruit, getting 90 minutes of exercise. On the topic of exercise, that's uh, not for today's conversation, but my strong suggestion is to try to make exercise something you have to do in your everyday life. For example, I live in the city and I have to walk my kids to school. And um, I mean, now they walk themselves for the most part, but I make myself walk them to school. And right there, I get 30 minutes of pretty good moderate exercise. I'm not out of breath walking them to school, except when we're late, when we have to run. But in general, it just makes me move a little bit. If you have to go up the stairs with your groceries, that's some more movement. And I'm always a big fan of if you have some cast iron dishes, cast iron cooking skillets, for example, making a few squats happen when you're um, taking them out of storage, which is also a great way to increase bone health and uh, prevent fractures. Conversation for another day. I go into a bit more detail about that again in the calcium post. And I think I talk about it in my book, uh, Flow in the Kitchen, where I talk about all sorts of... Um, different ways you can improve your life to uh, be more aligned with your values. Some more comments from the chat. Didn't know about flax seeds, so flax and fruit are low. Yeah, flax is really just a really cool food to eat and it doesn't taste like much. You can hide it in anything like muffins, sprinkle it on salad. My favorite way to do it is to put it on, um, on my breakfast, as you will see in a moment. I think I worry about the sugar content of fruit. For the love of everything that is holy and delicious, please do not worry about the fruit, the sugar in fruit. When the sugar is in fruit, it is not like eating a tablespoon of sugar. The sugar is in fruit is attached to an amazing package of nutrients and fiber and all fantastic things that are good for our health and that we really, really desperately need. And there's been even some studies where you show the difference in just adding like one piece of fruit per day in, in the participant's life. And their metrics went up spectacularly because it is such a powerful health lever that we can so easily pull. I'm not saying you should sit and eat three kilos of blueberries every day. That might cause some digestive problems, <laughs> though I did do that as a teenager. Um, I loved it. I would just get the blueberries and make them disappear while I was reading a book or something. Um, that's great, but probably not something to do every single day. But even then, I don't think it would be a huge problem from a health perspective unless you have some really rare condition. And I have to say, um, I am not a specialist in this area, but I am looking with a very perplexed eye at some of the medical and diet commentary that's made about diabetes management. I'm sometimes very mystified by some of the stuff I hear about that. And if you are dealing with pre-diabetes or diabetes, I encourage you to please, please, please look at the materials put out by Dr. Furman um, in particular, but also other plant-based physicians. Look for the diabetes keyword on nutritionfacts.org and try to get outside of the box. Um, if you've been caught in that box, please have a look because it might make your life way better. One more thing from the chat, definitely not getting a quarter teaspoon of turmeric per day, but 
if I can include other spices in that count, that is helpful. Yes, I think so. Uh, do you worry about the heavy metal content in spices? About the heavy metal content in spices. Thank you, Caitlin, for raising that. I really appreciate it. I've looked it up because you tipped me on it earlier. And there is a problem for sure with the contamination and uh, even uh, food fraud. So there's all sorts of foods. Uh, it was flagged by Health Canada a few years ago that in particular cumin and oregano that were sold in Canada were often not cumin and not oregano. And those were imported in bulk, maybe repackaged in Canada. And it turned out that a lot of the cumin contained chalk in it. Ew. And uh, really not something you want to eat. And oregano was just whatever kind of greenery they had uh, mixed in with a little bit of oregano for scent. That's a major problem. There's also an issue with turmeric being contaminated with lead, uh, lead chromate to be more specific, because it makes the color pop more. And I've looked a few num a number of studies up. Uh, it's been an issue in Bangladesh. It's been an issue in some parts of India. And it can absolutely be a concern in terms of spices that are imported. We don't grow very much turmeric in North America in general. And so it can be a concern. And it can be any brand. Organic doesn't make a difference. And buying it at Whole Foods and putting your whole paycheck on your turmeric will probably not make a difference either. So the key there for me to prevent this, um, there's techniques you can look up online um, to check if your turmeric in particular contains um, lead. You can do that. That's one thing to do. And then you don't buy that brand again. Myself, I vary the brands I get for turmeric. I use sometimes fresh turmeric and it would be the same with oregano. If you can grow your own or, or buy a you know, a small bundle of oregano at the farmer's market, and then you can dry your own. That obviously will be the best circumstance you can probably have. For cumin, I recommend buying whole cumin grains and grinding them yourself. And that way you will know that there is absolutely no chalk. I just still can't believe that people would do that. But cumin is more expensive than chalk. And it looks the same, apparently, with a little bit of coloring. So if you want to be safe on the cumin side, make sure to buy whole grains and grind it. Um, turmeric, again, you can use raw, fresh turmeric roots, but you can also test your turmeric and, again, spread your risk by buying different brands over time. So those are my suggestions. I don't worry about it, though, because I think with those strategies, I'm minimizing my exposure, and the benefits of those spices are way higher than the small amount of risk I'm getting. Your mileage may vary. About the fruit and the dentist. Um, it's an issue also. The um, acids in the fruit can be an issue also, uh, such as um, hibiscus flower. You can make hibiscus flower tea. It's really good for you, but it's not great for your, your teeth. So uh, rinsing off your mouth with, again, drinking plenty of water should do the trick. Okay, moving on. I'm aware that we need to keep going. Maybe you still don't quite believe me, right? Maybe you're a little concerned that yeah, maybe I'm doing all those things, but am I really hitting my nutrient targets? So let's check, right? Let's reverse a standard day of eating, and I will show you what I eat in a given day and um, give you some, some examples of how the nutrients add up. And to do that, okay, stay with me for a sec. I will have to share my screen in chronometer. Is it this one or this one? This one. Here we go. Share. Here we are. Okay, so you can see here, I hope you can see, please confirm in the chat that it's all good, but I'm going to lose you a little bit because I have to look at a different part of my screen. Okay, so, oh, hold on, my assistant is coming in the room. My son came there is a question about what kids should eat. And I promise I will get back to I will not forget. I will actually write it down here. How to get veggies for kids. That was Stephanie's questions. Okay. It's awesome to have an assistant. Okay. So I hope you can see 
in the chat. Uh, let me know that you can see my chronometer screen there. I think you can. Okay, so let's take a typical day in my diet. And I've done some previous data entry there and see how the nutrients add up. So if you don't already have a chronometer account, I'm not encouraging you necessarily to create one. But if you feel worried, if you have some anxiety about your nutrition and your nutrients intake on those various micro and macronutrients, why not have a look? Keep in mind that out of the box, if you just create an account, the targets that are there are not necessarily all completely appropriate for you. The recommended amounts of the micronutrients like iron and the different kinds of protein and, and so forth tend to be about right. However, out of the box, it looks like your protein amount is very, very high. And again, that goes back to our society's obsession with protein. That amount, in, that's the basic amount in chronometer, does not reflect the actual guideline of one gram of protein per kilogram of healthy body weight. And so I have adjusted my target in chronometer to be about 60 grams of protein per day. So let's enter the food I eat. What did I eat today? Well, I start my day with Brigitte's breakfast pudding. And what is in Brigitte's breakfast pudding? You won't be able to see it here, can you? No, you can't see it here. It's a custom recipe, but here's what it contains. It's two tablespoons of rolled oats. It also has two tablespoons of chia seeds, half a cup of soy milk. My soy milk is homemade, uh, but I, I didn't quite trust the data, so I'm using store-bought um, soy milk in here. And about just about one teaspoon of cinnamon and another teaspoon of ground flax seed. A tiny bit of uh, blackstrap molasses. That's an acquired taste, uh, I admit, but I love it. And it's a great source of iron. To my chia seeds and oats, I also add a pretty big handful of blueberries, roughly two thirds of a cup. And uh, what else is in there? Um, if I'm making the kids lunches and there's pieces of fruit kicking around, I just toss them in there. Add this to diary. What do we get? So I have 414 calories in that breakfast. And already with just the breakfast, I am meeting almost half of most of my essential amino acid needs in terms of protein. And then there's a bunch of, oh, I also add walnuts, I forgot to mention, to my breakfast. So there's a lot going on in that breakfast, lots of fiber, already a lot of iron, a significant amount of calcium at over 400 uh, micrograms, and some vitamin. The B12 here is uh, from the, um, the soy milk that I personally don't actually use, uh, but in normal supplemented soy milk, you, you would have some B12. But please don't look at that amount and feel good about it. I really recommend you read my article and take a supplement. So there's a lot going on, and that's just my breakfast. Now, what do I have next? Uh, in the morning, I usually get hungry, especially if I've had a big workout. And this week, uh, specifically, I made Drina Burton's Blueberry Lassi Muffins. So they're blueberry molasses muffin that are based on spelt flour. And I've modified her recipe because I never cook anything the way it's supposed to be. Um, I've added okara. So okara is the pulp from making soy milk. When you make soy milk, there's uh, fiber basically left behind and I never know what to do with it. So I have to bake a little bit and I threw it inside here. So there's about half a cup of okara and I've also added extra flax. Had a muffin, I had one serving, 82 grams or so. There's about 12 servings per recipe. Add this to my di diary. So that's about, uh, what does it say? 162 calories. And again, it adds some nutrients. So I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit to add more food. What did I have for lunch? So that's really key. I'm actually going to show you what's in that lunch salad. Every day, have a huge salad for lunch. And I know often I say for lunch, I encourage having leftovers. That is very convenient, but if you can, it's worth it to prep some salads for lunch and that will help you get a lot of nutrients in. Let me show you what's in my custom recipe for Brigitte's lunch salad. 
I have a little bit of smoked tofu, usually an apple or half an apple. Again, those might be leftovers from making the kids' lunches. One medium carrot that I grate or slice thinly. A red bell pepper, half a red bell pepper. It could be whole, it, you get the picture. Um, I add about three quarter cup quinoa. I don't always do this sometimes, I just add more vegetables. Um, but quinoa has lots of great whole protein in it. Um, and it's a, it's counts, it's technically a seed, but it counts as a grain. And uh, so yay for quinoa. Uh, a sprinkle of sunflower seeds. So that brings a little variety into my, my grains here. I use a pre-made, pre-washed salad mix most of the time. It's called uh, the Kale Slaw. President's Choice is the store brand of um, my favorite grocery store, No Frills. And it's basically Loblaws in Canada. It's a chain of grocery stores. So it's pre-mixed kale, broccoli stems. There's a bit of chard in there, pieces of, I, I think it's like pieces of all the green stuff they had that didn't fit anywhere that they put in the kale slaw. And I'm perfectly comfortable with that. I sometimes, quite often, half the time, have uh, mung bean sprouts that I make at home. So I add about half a cup of that. That's just for variety and good luck. And in this case, I added a handful also of edamame soybeans. They were shelled out of the shell about half a cup. And that brings me, let's go back to the food diary. I now have consumed 1200 calories in my day and I've definitely busted my fiber target, which is not a bad thing because the fiber target is only 25 grams, I think. I've got a lot of iron that's come in, a lot of calcium and lots of other vitamins and minerals here. I'm a bit low on lysine that will be fixed with my snack and dinner. So I want to say something here about the calcium target. Um, again, I recommend you read my whole article about calcium. But um, in North America, the calcium targets are completely inflated by the contribution contribution of the dairy industry to our guideline design. In other countries, such as China, um, the target for calcium on a dairy on a daily basis is 800, and in ca microgram, and in Canada, it's like 1,200 or something like that. In the U.S. as well, and those numbers at 1,200, I think, are completely ridiculous. And you can read more in the article about calcium, where in many places people consume more like 500 microgram of calcium, and they are doing quite fine in terms of their rates of uh, bone fracture. And so I think having 900 there already is a very healthy number, but the day is not even over. I only have 1200 calories in. And um, something else to keep in mind is that bone health is not just about calcium. It's also about vitamin D, vitamin K, and uh, weight bearing resistance exercise that will make our bones stronger. So again, going back to squatting when you lift your cast iron or doing any sorts of resistance exercise is good for us. Uh, yes, thank you for the question, Caitlin, about the dressing on the salad. So I have not included it here because um, it was getting a little busy, but whenever possible, I make a batch of dressing on the weekend. And my favorite thing is to have a handful of raw cashews with a bit of water, lemon juice, a little bit of apple cider vinegar, and uh, garlic powder. Fresh garlic, I find by the end of the week, will taste like really strong, so garlic powder doesn't have that problem. A little bit of salt and pepper, mustard, which is also a cruciferous vegetable, so why not add it to the dressing? And I blend all that in the Vitamix, and it makes a really nice creamy uh, dressing with a little bit of an acid touch in it from the lemon juice and the apple cider vinegar. Um, it's got the cashews, but it doesn't make it tremendously high in calories compared to a dressing that would be made with only oil, for example. And if it's a good week and I'm well stocked, I may also add a couple of tablespoons after blending of poppy seeds. And that just adds another food that I can add to my list of 30 foods in the week. That is something that I didn't mention in the in the frameworks aspect, but many of you are aware that there's a lot of research that's been done about the diversity, the importance of eating a diversity of different foods to make our gut bacteria happy. And when I, I show you, for example, this lunch salad, 
Well, all of those ingredients could be shifted to just one different ingredient on the next day. For example, if I sprinkle my salad with sunflower seeds, well, tomorrow I can use hemp seeds instead. And the next day I can use pumpkin seeds. If I'm making muffins with spelt flour one week, I can make muffins with wheat flour the other week. If I'm using chia seeds and oats in my breakfast, I can replace the oats by rye flakes on a different week, for example. Or I've even used, quin I've seen quinoa flakes at my grocery store, which is pretty cool. So you can make those little changes, those little tweaks, and you can change, obviously, the vegetables. Sometimes you have kale, sometimes you have chard, sometimes you have broccoli, sometimes you have cauliflower. And you don't need to have completely different meals. You can just change, substitute within the same category of ingredients. And those of you who are familiar with my approach to freestyle cooking, I often say there's only really three recipes you need. You need to know how to make soups, which is pretty much the same thing as stews. You need to know how to make stir fries. And you need to know how to make salads or bowls. Bowls being salads that have like separate piles and salads have everything you know mixed together and you could even I was making a stir fry this week and I was thinking that's really a hot salad <laughs> you know so once you understand those basics you don't need to worry too much uh, about the diversity of ingredients you just need to do little tweaks in a separate workshop at some point or I need to make a piece of content about that I will show you how I organize my pantry to make sure that you can easily see those ingredients and make those substitutions that's a conversation for another day. So I'm sorry, the uh, dressing ingredients are not here on chronometer, but you get the picture. I will move on quickly to add some more food to my day. I get hungry in the afternoon. What do I have? Um, let's add a couple of rice cake. I like rice cakes. They're a good way to bring a very important food to my mouth. So two rice cakes with hummus. And I could have homemade hummus, but um, my kids really like the President's Choice hummus and whatever works for them. So let's add two tablespoons of hummus. So that's my afternoon snack. And then I will add my dinner, which is, uh, for example, so there's a recipe in the vegan meal plans, which is my meal planning service called the Peanutty Yam Stew. You may have seen that elsewhere as like African peanut stew or something like that, but it has chickpeas, lentils, sweet potatoes, and I add a lot of extra greens, again, to make sure I hit my target. One serving of this recipe, I add this to my diary, and let's see what the results are. I'm sitting currently, I feel like I'm forgetting something. I only have 1,700 calories so far, so I could eat a few more things here because I figure that I need 2,000 to 2,200 calories daily to sustain my, my healthy body weight and my level of activity. But I'm already at 73 grams of protein here, as you can see. I've got plenty of carbs. See, it's out of zero because I don't have a target. And the fats I'm consuming are very much healthy fat. Lots of omega-3s, whey, favorable ratio here. I have a lot of omega trees and not too much omega-6. If I was using cooking oils, uh, you would see the omega-6 number go up a fair bit. I'm not having any trans fats and I have a small amount of saturated fats, but nothing really to be scared of. What it is here, uh, the saturated fat is from the peanutty yam stew. This is one of my um, slightly decadent recipes that has coconut milk in it. So that's why you have saturated fat. I don't usually use coconut milk, so if I took that out here, you would have pretty much no saturated fat. I'm trying to find out. Yeah, there's probably a little bit of saturated fat in some of the grains I'm using uh, there, but it's it's really quite insignificant. Looking at protein, all the targets for all, sorry, this is all moving. Uh, all the targets for the essential amino acids are met and you know blown out of the ballpark again. What about the vitamins? So most of the vitamins here, and so there would be some effort to be made in terms of snacking to hit a little bit higher on these, but I'm not worried about 94% of my riboflavin. If I just change my foods a little bit tomorrow, I'll be over the target. Vitamin D is very low, obviously, and B12, because those are not present in most plant foods. So as I said, very important to um, supplement. 
Vitamin E is exceptionally low here. It's still 75% of the target, but because I'm not using any oils. So if you're using cooking oils, you're going to hit those targets for vitamin E without a problem. And finally, the minerals. So selenium is a little low, um, and I'm not uncomfortable with that. Um, selenium is especially found in, um, if memory serves, um, Brazil nuts. And I think you actually don't want to have too, too much. And I, I have my four Brazil nuts on the fourth of the month, every month per Dr. Gregor's recommendation. So I'm not too worried about that. And sodium sitting at 1300 milligrams of sodium here, which I think is, is I've, I kept saying micrograms earlier, but it's milligrams. I should have been saying, I apologize. Um, but so in this case, 1300 milligram of sodium, pretty comfortable with that. And there's still room, since I'm only at 1,700 calories, for some extra snacks, some more fruit. Um, and I haven't counted this specific version, but I know there's cruciferous vegetables. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. There's cruciferous vegetables in... Um, there we go. I'm back. There's cruciferous vegetables in the salad. There's cruciferous vegetables in the peanut yam stew. There's lots of vegetables everywhere. There's fruit in my breakfast. Um, oh, I know what I uh, that's missing from there also is like an orange. I will add an orange as a snack. There's lots of other things like that that I can be eating. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat now. Would be a great time for that. And I'm going to answer the question about getting vegetables into kids because I know my son is listening. So first of all, the key thing is not to worry too much about those things and not to make food an issue, not to make bodies a battleground and to be comfortable with some variety. So right now, my kids love fruit. They have a lot of fruit. How much vegetable they eat is really variable. Uh, my daughter is a lot more open-minded. My son a little bit less so at the moment. But he'll have things like cucumber. He will eat things like tomatoes on a somewhat regular basis. He, We have sushi and he will ask for the shiitake sushi that has pieces of shiitake mushrooms in it. I think encouraging exploration is really key. It's okay to sneak in foods. For example, I make waffles and once in a while I throw in, if I have a little bit of cooked squash, I throw it in the waffle batter or it works also throwing it a bit of cooked squash in muffins, for example. And that's fine. I think mostly it makes us feel good. It's good for their gut biome, of course, to be exposed to more different vegetables. But the important is to keep on offering and to make it fun and to make it enjoyable and to have the relationships come first, which doesn't mean being okay with, you know, children having zero vegetables and giving up on it, not at all, but continuing on and exposing. And I think what will have the most influence is what the parents are eating and showing that the parents are eating the healthy food and enjoying it, not eating it because it's a duty or a, or a chore. Um, that will make the most difference in the long term because as you probably all have found out by now, we very much grow up to become largely like our parents. And so we follow in their footsteps, sometimes whether we like it or not. But so if we model really positive behavior around a diversity of whole plant foods, then chances are that our kids are going to do the same. I have a workshop uh, that um, you can watch about... My son says he also likes broccoli. He came in to tell me that. He wanted it to be on the record, so now it is. And I have this workshop about helping um, picky eaters, as people often call them. Uh, I'd rather use highly selective eaters. Choose the foods they like and get more open-ended and open-minded about what is on their green list. I recommend you watch that workshop. If you go in the program section of my website, you will find that there's a couple of blog posts on the topic. Also in my uh, Healthy Vegan Toolkit post that you can find on my website, there's a number of references about supporting uh, selective eaters. If there's any more questions, I'm going to check email right now. I don't see anything in the email and I currently don't see anything in the chat, but I'll give it another few seconds. And I will take that opportunity to invite you, um, here we go, to ask you two things. Um, number one, share my screen. 
this window. So please, please, please tell me in the chat if you've learned one useful thing today, please put it in the chat. I would love to know what it is. And I would like to ask you for feedback. This is super important for me that people who come to my live events let me know if they've learned anything, if they've felt more empowered for being here. So please go and fill the feedback form. It's at tinyurl.com slash vfk hyphen nutrients hyphen feedback. You're going to get that by email in just six minutes. So please complete the feedback form. I really appreciate it. And there's going to be also a 30% off coupon that you can access to um, subscribe to any of my programs or participate in my 5,000 meal solution course. And I'd like to remind you that I wrote this lovely book called Flow in the Kitchen that will help you continue cooking everyday wholesome healthy vegan meals without the stress. Because all of this that I've talked about today is lovely and beautiful, but if you're not actually cooking the food and eating it, it's not helping. And I know we all love to watch cooking videos, but sometimes it's a bit more of a step to actually go and cook. But that's what makes the biggest difference. And if you need any help shifting your mindset to embrace cooking with more dedication and love and care, I'm happy to help and you will find a lot of motivation. Some people have told me just reading the introduction of the book made them feel way better about cooking. And you can read the intro for free if you go on Amazon. I'm pretty sure you can download the first chapter, almost all of it for free and read it that way. And I hope it helps. I look very much forward to um, receiving your feedback in the feedback forms. And if you have any more questions, don't hesitate to ask me by email or um, by the chat box on my website at any time. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. And I look forward to seeing you again in the kitchen. Join me in the cooking club. And the most important thing is keep on cooking because thank you so much. It makes a world of difference to me and to pretty much everybody else on the planet that you are caring about what you eat and uh, supporting yourself and your loved ones show up their best in the world. So thank you very much for being here and have a wonderful rest of your day.